Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to continue our journey through this unit on probability. And in this section here, we're going to be talking about counting strings with replacement. We'll find out what a string is here in a second. But first off, let's look at this multiplication counting principle. This is saying that if A and B are finite sets, meaning they don't go on infinitely, they have a finite set of numbers, the number of ways to choose one element from A and one element from B would be to take the number of elements in A times the number of elements in B. For example, let's look at the Price is Right example here. It says we have this spinner that's divided into 24 congruent sections, are numbered like the picture on the right. Each contestant can spin the wheel twice. Describe a sample space S for this experiment and determine the number of elements in S. So the sample space here would refer to the uh, value they get on the first spin and the value they get on the second spin. So to figure out how many possible elements there would be, we will, there's 24 sections on that spinner on the first spin. And on the second spin, there's still going to be the same number of sections. We don't, whatever they get on the first spin, you don't take that away for the second spin. It's still going to be there. So we'd have 24 elements in the second, uh, first spin and in the second spin. Multiply those together, and we get a total of 576 elements between the two spins. Well, let's look at this one. A lottery game played in some states involves picking three digits from 0 to 9 in order. Describe a sample space for this experiment and determine the number of elements in the sample space. Now, from 0 to 9, don't look at that very quickly because otherwise you might think that there's only nine numbers in that set. There's actually 10 because you're including 0. So there's actually 10 numbers in, that we can choose from. Um, and you can repeat the digits. So as far as how many possible um, elements there would be in this sample space, there would be 10 numbers we can choose for the first digit. There's 10 numbers we can use in the second digit and 10 numbers we could use in the third digit for a total of 1,000 elements. So that's how we would apply that, that uh, principle. Let's talk about strings now. When the symbols in a problem must be ordered, so whenever, whatever we're working with in a problem must be ordered. It is common to refer to the ordering list of symbols as strings. The number of symbols in a string is the number of symbols in a string is the length of the string. For example, here we have a 10 question multiple choice math test. Each question has five choices. How many possible completed answer sheets are there? So the way that we would look at this is there's again there's a total of 10 questions. Each question has five choices. So we would have 5 times itself, we would have 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. So 5 times itself 10 times. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it would have 5 being multiplied times itself 5 times. And this would be a string. It would be a string of 10 numbers. So an easy way to write this would be to write it as 5 to the 10th power. In other words, the base represents the number of choices. The expo exponent represents the length of the string. So I would have my base is 5. The length of the string is that there's 10 numbers in the string, so it would be 5 to the 10th power, which would give me 9,765,625. So there's 9,765,625 uh, different answer sheets that would be available. Now, only one of those is going to be correct. So the probability in part B, what is the probability of answering all 29 questions correctly? Well, again, there's only one of them, so it'll be 1 out of the 9,765,625 be your answer. Why don't you try the next one on your own? Three of the questions on a science test are multiple choice with four choices each. How many ways are there to answer these questions? So why don't you try this one on your own, so pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check to see if you have the correct answer. Okay, well, let's see if you did this correctly. Now, this time here, there's four choices each. So our base would be four. The length of the string is how many of those are going to be repeated. There's three questions that have four choices each, so it's going to be four cubed, which would be 64. Now, looking at it this way gives us this next concept. 
And this next concept is that uh, if we have this theorem with strings with replacement, so we can replace the values each time, gives us uh, this theorem of n to the k power, where n is the number of elements, k is the length of the string. So in that previous example where we would have four choices each, that would be the number of elements in each choice, as there's four choices. So we'd have a base four. The length of the string is the fact that since there would be three uh, questions that would be like that, your exponent would be three. So that's why we have four cubed. So let's apply this in a different way. Let's look at license plates. In a certain state, license plates have two letters followed by four digits from zero to nine. How many license plates are possible? Well, first off, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. So the license plate is going to start with two letters followed by four digits. Well, again, those two letters is 26 um, letters in the alphabet. So there's 20 mix, 26 elements in that set. The string here of those would be there's two of them because there's 26 with options for this first uh, letter in the, uh, on the license plate. There's 26 letters to choose from for the second letter on the license plate. So the length of that string is 2. Now we're going to multiply that times the string here for the digits from 0 to 9. So we could have 0 to 9 in this first spot. We could have 0 to 9 here, 0 to 9 here, 0 to 9 here. Now each of those are going to have 0 to 9, remember, represents a total of 10 elements in that set. And this string has a length of 4 units. So we would have 10 to the 4th power. So when you take 26 squared times 10 to the 4th power, we end up getting 6,760,000. So there would be 6,760,000 license plates you could come up with uh, for those cars. Now some states allow plates to have three letters followed by four digits from 0 to 9. Oops. So we would have, this time we would have three letters followed by four digits from 0 to 9. So why don't you guys take a second and figure out how many combinations there would be in these states, or for these license plates. So why don't you pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check to see if you have the correct answer. Okay, so let's see how you did. You should have um, noticed that it's very similar to the previous problem. This time, though, we'd have whoops, 26 letters in the alphabet, so 26 elements in that set with a string of 3. Multiply that times the fact that, again, 0 to 9, we would have 10 digits, and that's got a string of 4. Multiply those together, and we get 175,760,000 different license plates that you can make. Now, we think of events A and B as independent events. If the probability of A does not affect the probability of B, to find the probability that a number of independent events will occur, you can multiply using the multiplication counting principle. So going back to that spinner that we were dealing with, with the uh, wheel of, or not wheel of fortune, the price is right, what you got on the first spin does not impact what you get on the second spin. So those would be independent events. Let's look at a different spinner, though. This one, forgot to put the spinner on the page here, so let me just make a spinner real quick. We're going to make a spinner that's got uh, approximately six equal sections. We'll just number them one to six. And we're going to use that to answer example 4a. So it says, the spinner here is using a carnival game. It is assumed to be fair. The game consists of two spins. You win if the first spin stops on an even number, and the second spin stops on a multiple of three. What is the prob probability of winning? Now, first off, the even numbers here would be 2, 4, and 6. So the probability of giving, getting an even number, you would get 3 out of 6, or 1 half. The probability of getting a multiple of 3, well, those would be 3 and 6, or only multiples of 3. So we would have a 2 and 6 chance of getting those right, which is the same as 1 third. So using that um, multiplication counting principle, we can multiply these two probabilities together. And when you do, you get 1 half times 1 third gives you a 1 and 6 chance of winning. 
Why don't you guys try this next one on your own? In a certain spinning wheel, there are 20 sectors of equal size. In 18 of these sectors, you win a prize, but in the other two, you lose all your winnings. If the wheel spins randomly, what is the probability of winning five prizes and then losing on the sixth spin? So again, in 18 of the sectors, you win a prize, but in the other two, you lose all your winnings. You want to figure out what's the probability of winning five prizes and then on the sixth spin, losing everything. So why don't you guys take a second, try this one on your own, and pause, so pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check to see if you have the correct answer. Okay, so let's check to see how you did on this one. What you might recognize is the fact that we have the same probability on those first five spins to win, which would be 18 out of 20. So that means you have a string of five elements there, so 18 out of 20. So we could have 18 divided by 20 to the fifth power. And you multiply that times the probability of losing on the sixth spin of 2 over 20. Again, you could have reduced those, or since we're dealing with such large numbers, we could leave them the same here. And when you do that on your calculator, you end up getting 0 0.059 approximately as your answer, which as a percent is about, if you move the decimal two places to the right, is about 6%. So you have about a 6% chance of winning five times a row and then losing on the sixth spin. Now, you want to make sure that you include this piece that just popped up on the screen. I forgot to include that in the original notes. But it's important to know that events are independent if probability of A times the probability of B is equal to the probability of the intersection of A and B. So events that are not independent then are what we call dependent events. So let's look at an example here. It says the spinner is used in a carnival game. It's the same one that we looked at before. This time you win if the first spin stops on an even number and the sum of both spins is greater than 8. We want to show that the two events are dependent. Now to help us out, just to give us uh, something to look at here, even though I know we're dealing with the spinner, the spinner has six sections. That's the same amount of sections on the dice. So it makes sense to also look at this dice to see all the number of possibilities between the two spins. So the probability of getting an even number on the first spin would be A. And the probability of the getting a um, sum greater than 8 oops, would be our, we'll use that as our event B. And the sum of an even number on the first spin, well, that happens, uh, well, you can look at the spinner for that. That happens by getting a 2, 4, or a 6, which is 3 out of 6, or 1 half of the time. And the probability of getting a sum greater than 8, well, we can look at this diagram here. These would be the times we would get a sum greater than 8. We would get a 6 on the first spin and a 3 on the second. 5 on the first spin, 4 on the second, and so on. So there's a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 possibilities out of 36, which that reduces to 5 over 18. So now what we've got to do is we've got to figure out, well, does the probability of multiplying these two equal the same as the probability of getting those two at the same time? So if I multiply these two together, 1 half times 5 eighteenths, I get 5 over 36. So now I need to see, do I get the same result if I find the probability of getting an even on the first spin and a sum of 8, or a sum greater than 8? So that happens here when I get a, a 6 on the first spin or a 4 on the first spin. So that happens where, and where we get a total of sum greater than 8. Um, that happens 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times out of 36. So those two probabilities are not the same. So these are not independent. So that means these two are dependent. That's how we would illustrate this. Let's look at this next one. It says, referring back to this example, where in a certain spinning wheel there are 20 sectors of equal size, in 18 of these sectors you win a prize, but in the other two you lose all your winnings. If the wheel spins randomly, what is the probability of winning five prizes and then losing on the sixth spin? So that's referring back to the example that we've already looked at. 
Uh, it says, is losing on the sixth spin independent of what happens on the first five spins? Why or why not? So we have to prove again, just like we did in the previous example, of whether or not the probability of A times the probability of B is that equal to the probability of A intersection B. So let's call event A the probability of winning a prize in the first five spins. So the probability of that happening, the probability of um, winning on the first five, that is, well, there's an 18 and 20 chance of us winning on just one spin, but repeated five times. That's going to be um, 18 divided by 20 to the fifth power, which is, which is approximately we'll say 0.59. And the probability, we'll call event B, the probability of losing on the sixth spin. And that is, well, we have a, there's two sections out of 20 that would result in losing. So we have a 2 and 20 chance, or 0.1 probability of that happening. So, let me scroll down a little bit here. So the probability of A times the probability of B would be 0.59 times 0.1, which when you multiply those together, you get approximately 0 0.059. And if you remember, we already found in the previous example, we already found the probability of A intersection B earlier to be 0 0.059 as well. So the fact that the probability of A times the probability of B is the same as the probability of A intersection B tells us that they are independent. So that's how we can prove that these two items would be independent. Well, that's it. That you will be successful in your assignment. So with that, good luck.